Good morning. Oh, that was great. That was great. I even got a wave from the back. That was wonderful. Good morning and welcome to the worship services here at the Woodstock Church of Christ. If you would take a moment and look at your surroundings, you will notice something wonderful. We have songbooks back. Woo! It's an exciting day. And if you're visiting, we also have attendance cards. And if you're not, not visiting, we still have attendance cards. But if you are visiting, please fill out the blue side. If you're a member, please fill out the other side. Pass those to the center aisle. Yes? No? I don't know what, sure what we're going to do with them. Nobody gave me that instruction. <laughs> but anyway, we have them, so it's exciting. All right. We do have a uh, few announcements. If you didn't, didn't pick up a bulletin, please do so before you leave today. There's several things that we're not going to go over, but uh, we will cover a couple of things. Thursdays, Thursdays at 7 to 9 p.m., we are going to have the sewing club again, fellowship. It will be in the fellowship hall. Um, if you are graduating or have graduated uh, from high school or college, our recognition day will be Sunday, June 6th. And we need to have pictures submitted to the office by this Wednesday. So that's May 26th. Please include the name of the school or college. If you're graduating college, please also include the degree. If you have a cell phone, please take it out at this time, silence it, turn it off so that you're not the person everybody turns around and says, ooh, that's your ringtone. And again, we are reading through the Bible in a year. The June cards are available in the foyer. Please pick one up if you haven't yet. We're certainly glad that you're here. We're going to start our worship services in song in just a moment. Uh, we have Lincoln's going to make an announcement about VBS. And then we will begin our worship services in song. And we would like to ask you to stand for the song once we listen to Lincoln. Thank you. Good morning. I thought I would have the most exciting announcement with VBS, but we have attendance cards, and that's way more exciting. <laughs> Upstage me, Joe. I appreciate it. Uh, so VBS got swallowed by COVID last year. It's back this year, June 13th through the 16th. And so um, what I need, uh, that's three weeks from now, what I need desperately is volunteers. And so I put a sign-up sheet out in the back. Uh, there's two, one for June 12th, and that's just for the setup day. We always set up the, the Saturday before. And then I have another two sign-up sheets. It's like 30 or so spots that we need uh, for all the, uh, all the areas that we need help with. Now, you'll see two different types of, of sign-ups. One is to be a leader of an area, and the other is a, is a helper. The first thing that I need is leaders in all these spots. Don't let that scare you. Don't be intimidated. It'll be all right. Uh, I, need, I need leaders to, to, to kind of lead and coordinate each one of these areas, crafts, snacks, you know, what, whatever thing is there. Um, really appreciate your help uh, and uh, looking forward to a great VBS this year. Thank you. As uh, some of you found out already this morning, the elevator is not functioning today. So uh, I know we're trying to all exit out the back uh, lower door, but if you need uh, the elevator, uh, please just exit out to the carport area and have someone pull your vehicle or uh, pick you up there. Um, so please, if you need the elevator, don't walk down that direction because it will not work and so you, you will have wasted your time and energy, energy. Let's stand together as we start our worship off by singing Hallelujah, Praise Jehovah. And if you would like to use a songbook, it is song number 200. Let's sing. Hallelujah, Praise Jehovah.
Father, we come before you today thanking you for your love. We praise your name, Father. We praise you in all that we do. We pray today that, that you continue to watch over us. We thank you for your word, for the clarity that's in the word. We thank you for loving us enough to lift us out of our situation and, and grace us with the opportunity to come back into reunion with you. Father, I pray that our life and our actions seek you, promote you, glorify you, and that this church and your kingdom is glorified by how we behave with each other, how we behave with the world, and how we behave in respect to sin. Father, we pray that you continue to watch over and guide and strengthen and protect our ministries, our families, and this church, our leadership, and this country. Father, we also pray for those that are bereaving and hurt and despairing and confused. We pray that they find solace in your word and in the love that we have for them. Father, we pray that, that your work be done in our lives and this church fervently and wholeheartedly. And we pray that you're with us today as we worship and bring praise to your name. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. <laughs> The song before the Lord's Supper this morning is He Loves Me, number 217. Why did the Savior heavenly man come to earth below? Where He gave himself to 
Before we begin to partake of the Lord's Supper, I would ask if everyone was able to pick up a communion cup this morning. If you weren't, please raise your hand and one of our ushers will make sure that you have one. In John 3, 16, the scriptures read, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And why did he do that? Because he loves us so. It goes on to say in, chapter, in verse 17 that God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. As I was thinking about this last night before in preparation of this, I was wondering, I, I, I forgot about verse 17, that he didn't send him to condemn the world, but that he sent him to save the world through him, through his love for us. He didn't come to condemn us to put a set of rules on us that we couldn't meet or that we couldn't live by but he came with love and he gave himself freely to the cross for you and I he suffered the cross for you and I let me say that one more time he suffered the cross for you and I for our sins he left his heavenly father for you and I. What love that is. I've got two girls. Many of you have sons and daughters. Could you send one of them to save someone else? What love that God has for us. What love that Christ has for us that he would be willing to suffer the cross for us, for me. And we don't deserve it. But he loves us enough to have done it. As we partake of the Lord's Supper this morning, let us remember that love. Let us remember that sacrifice. And let's humbly respectfully and in honor give thanks for that sacrifice that he gave for our sins on the cross. If you would, please bow with me as we give thanks for the bread. Our dear Father in heaven, we humbly approach your throne, giving thanks to you for this bread which represents your son's body upon the cross. Lord, we thank you for that sacrifice. We thank you for that love that you have shown for us through your son and for your son's sacrifice for our sins. As we partake of this, may our minds go back to Calvary. May we remember that love that was shown to us on the cross and partake of this bread in a worthy and pleasing manner to you. For it is through his most holy name that we pray. Amen.
bow with me as we partake or as we give thanks for the cup. Dear Father, our, our prayer continues for this cup, which to us represents Christ's shed blood upon the cross. Lord, we give thank, thanks for this emblem. We give thanks for the blood that was shed to cover the multitude of sins that we have. And as we partake of this cup, may we do so in remembrance of the love that was shown to us on that cross by your son. And it's in his most holy name we pray. Amen. At this time, we have <clears throat> the privilege of giving thanks for our offering. We have several ways that we can contribute through a donation box in the foyer. Uh, we also have an online presence for you to be able to go on and give there or to mail your offerings into the church office. At this time, would you bow with me as we give thanks for the, the offering? Dear Lord, we know that you bless us in so many ways and that all belongs to you and that we are just stewards of that which you most bountifully give us. Lord, we pray that we would be good stewards of your blessing and that as we give back a portion of that which you have blessed us with, may we do so with a giving heart so that the word of your, that, so that your word may be spread throughout this community and throughout this country and throughout the entire world. Lord, we pray that you would bless this offering, bless those who give, for it is through your son's name we pray. Amen. Before Owen comes to read the scripture uh, to us this morning and before Matt's lesson, let's stand together and sing Jesus Loves Little Children and Jesus Loves Me. We'll sing them back to back. I would like, you to, I would like to ask you to remain standing after we sing these songs in the reverence to the reading of God's word. <laughs> Jesus loves the little children. morning comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 16 verses 1 and 2. Again that's 1 Corinthians chapter 16 verses 1 and 2 and I'll be reading from the English Standard Version. Now concerning the collection for the saints as I directed the churches of Galatia so you also are to do. On the first day of every week each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper so that there will be no collecting when I come. You may be seated. <clears throat> there are some other things that we're noticing uh, perhaps for the first time in a long time. Are you noticing the clarity of singing? I don't know if you're just singing louder 
or if uh, taking all the masks off make that big of a difference. I think a little bit of both. And I appreciate that very much. And, uh, and I'm sure many do. And we're thankful for your presence this morning. And as I think about uh, worshiping God and, and the joy of going to heaven, I've come to realize that during this service, this is uh, the first time that uh, I am worshiping at this congregation, uh, even in spirit, with my good friend Harold Smith. And um, I've thought about him today. And I appreciate uh, the influence that he's had on my life and I'm sure many of your lives. And uh, I'm just thinking this is uh, going to make heaven even more sweeter uh, as we continue our journey here and being able to look forward to seeing him and, and the rest of the faithful from this congregation and from all time. We're going back now to our unity theme and we're looking at different subjects, different topics of how we can recognize the New Testament church. We've dealt with the prophecy of the church from uh, the Old Testament scripture. We have seen from uh, Isaiah 2 and Daniel 2 and Joel 2 the combination of the birth of the church in Acts chapter 2. And when one notices these things, he can be aware of the New Testament church and what it is. We've, we've studied the organization of the church, how's it, how it's to be organized. You know, you look at the religious world today and the organization of religious groups is, uh, is, is amazing. How many different kinds of uh, orders there are to religious groups. But you know, it's not that complicated in Scripture. It is very clearly set forth and understood and we honor God and we praise him for these things that are recognizable if we bring them forward in our lives today. We've noticed uh, most recently uh, the worship of the church. As is the case with so many things in religious, there doesn't seem to be an exact pattern that's, that's ordered. But you know in scripture, worship has always always been dictated by God and not left up to man's desires. And so it is with the uh, New Testament church. We've noticed singing, uh, a cappella in nature, and the Lord's Supper, and what are the emblems that we partake of during the Lord's Supper. We've noticed what gospel preaching, biblical preaching is, and today we come to our next uh, avenue of worship, and that is giving. You know, there are many names in Scripture that, um, that denote our God-likeness. Christian, godliness, spiritual. We've noticed one in our Bible class this morning, sons of God. These names all denote something that has to do with our Father who art in heaven. But there are also certain characteristics that must be found in us if we are going to wear these titles appropriately. And in my mind, the one characteristic that outshines them all is a giver. Why is it that everything that God creates gives. It doesn't take back. It gives. No matter what it is. Wouldn't you suppose that as we are made in the image of God physically, but also as we are born again into his family and become a son, small s, of God? Wouldn't it be just as appropriate that we model the giving nature of the one whose name we bear. Everyone knows John chapter 3 and verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave. And he gave the best of heaven. And so it should be of extreme importance to us. God gave his best how can we fall short of that? Or at least in the attempt to give our very best. 
God gave us the supreme example in the gift of Jesus Christ. When the Bible says he spared not his own son. He didn't hold back the greatest of heaven. And you and I dare not hold back our best either. Either more specifically as we look at this uh, avenue of worship. And giving is an avenue of worship. Every worship that you look at in scripture. The people were required to give. In fact, David said at the threshing floor of Arana, I will not give anything to the Lord which doesn't cost me something. The gift of a Christian is to be a sacrificial gift. God is not interested in your leftovers. He wants you first. And if he has you first, then lessons about giving aren't quite as necessary. But we need to make sure that he has us first. It costs, think about this, it costs God much more to redeem man than it did to create man. You know, we think of uh, how much money it costs to uh, begin a business or, or, to, or to build a house. And we think, as even we're studying in our adult class, the nature of creation and how things began. And we think of that intricate design in creation, even in the human race itself and the body and how it functions. How much is that worth? Oh, that purchase price doesn't even begin to compare with the purchase price of what God gave on Calvary. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9, Paul reminds us that through, that though Christ was rich, he became poor, yet for our sakes he became poor, and through that poverty we become rich. Those are the riches that God's person seeks. He willingly, did you, did you get that part of the verse? He willingly became poor. I want to ask you something. In your spirituality, how willing are you to become poor? You know, we can't be the servants that God wants us to be unless we are what? Poor in spirit. And that's the basic part of us, our spirit, our minds. Are we poor in spirit? What does that mean? Just as Jesus left heaven, left all of the riches that this earth's riches couldn't even compare. He left all of the real riches and he became poor for our sakes. And as children of God, he's asking us to become poor like that. To have the humble mind that says, hey, I don't need the things in life to define me, to make me who I am. It's something totally different. It's a different concept. And God gave us his best, and so we should give the first and the best of everything. In Exodus chapter 13, back under the law, it was interesting here what what God told Moses and what Moses relates to us. Chapter 13, beginning at verse 1, there is this concept of giving God the best. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, Consecrate me to me all the firstborn. Whatever opens the womb among the children of Israel, both of man and beast, God says, it is is mine. Do you live life with that idea in your mind? That the best that I have is God. No matter what area we're talking about. The best of my time, the best of my talent, the best of my money, the best of anything. It is God's. Now, it's one thing to correlate with that in theory. 
It's another thing altogether to apply that to a life. When we think of giving in worship, we've given a lot of things. Hopefully, if we've worshiped in spirit and truth, we must give it. We must give it. Was it the best? You know, as it relates to our giving, some people view giving as a burden and not a blessing or an opportunity. We should understand that God views giving as a grace. Do we so view it? God views giving as a proof of sincerity of mind and soul. Is that the way that we think of it? The subject of giving needs to be highlighted from time to time to continually keep before our minds what God expects. He expects us to give. Name one aspect of Christianity that doesn't include giving. What is it? Think of one aspect of the life of Christ that didn't relate to giving in some form or fashion. The Bible instructs us that our giving needs to be personal. Much like our religion. Much like our spirituality. There's a personal aspect of it. We have a personal relationship with our Lord. And so that should be seen even in our worship as we give. Notice that Paul tells the Corinthians... In uh, 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 2, upon the first day of the week, let each of one of you lay by him in store as God has prospered him. Paul says that there be no gatherings when he would come. Each Christian required to give each first day of the week. Some translations even say every Sunday. Now, I don't know how much time we have to take in order to explain what every Sunday means. Since you've been prospered, and as you have been prospered in a proportionate amount, you give of that every first day of the week. Let each one of you, you hear the personal nature of that? Do it on the first day of the week. Paul also reminds us in Romans chapter 14 and verse 12, so then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. It's interesting. That account, that account that we give, comes at the end of our lives, comes when we get to judgment. That's what we're going to give finally. And when we give that final account... A lot of that is going to have to do with what we gave on this earth. Was our lives just a matter of seeing what we could accumulate? And it wasn't giving as the Lord has instructed within his saved body? It is his body. And when we think of giving God glory and worshiping in the church of his body... As he gave that body, and you and I are members of that body, then those members are to give. Not grudgingly. Or because we feel we have to, of necessity. But the Lord loves a cheerful giver. It's a personal kind of consideration. But not only is our giving to be personal, our giving is to be planned. It's to be planned. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 7, Every man according as he has purposed in his heart. So let him give. I guess this takes away the mandatory tithe of the Old Testament. Tithing doesn't just mean giving. That's not the definition of the word tithe. The definition of that word is tenth. And it's interesting how God and what God required a tenth of in the Old Testament. But be that as it may, God does not require a tenth. He requires something much better. He requires your heart. And if he has your heart, 
I don't know how many times the question has been asked, publicly, privately, how much should I give? Can we answer that question once and for all? You give it all. You give it all. Heaven did not hold anything back. We give it all. We give it all. Now, that doesn't mean that we give every penny that we own in the collection on the Lord's Day. But you know what? When Jesus told the rich young ruler, sell all that you have, give it to the poor, and come follow me. What does that teach us? That teaches us this. God knows by our heart and by the way that we live whether or not we would be willing to give it all. And that's what made the Macedonians in 2 Corinthians uh, chapters 8 and 9 so marvelous is that they, be, that they gave beyond their means. They gave it all. Now, does that mean that they gave every penny? I doubt it. But they were willing to give all of themselves and then the amount seemed to fall in place. And that's the way it will be with our lives. Our giving is to be personal and it's to be planned. And you know what? We need to make sure that we give God the first fruits and not let the bills that we have and the debt that we mistakenly got in allow our contribution to God suffer. God gets the part of the top and everything else flows around it. In the third place, instructions are given by God concerning our giving and they are to be periodic. Paul talked about it. This giving is to be done on the first day of the week. You know, it, it's indeed strange how many religious groups Never seemingly miss taking up a contribution each and every week. But you know the same wording, the same preposition every, kata, is seen in both the regularity of our partaking of the Lord's Supper and our giving every Sunday. And it's amazing on the flip side of that. If we would decide uh, one Sunday that we weren't going to take the Lord's Supper... I think that there would be a few people in this assembly that would uh, have a thing or two to say about that. But you know, if each Christian doesn't give every Sunday, then that doesn't seem to be quite as a, as a significant thing. In fact, when we think of all of our worship, perhaps the giving gets a little less pub because... Why? Why? Paul said, as I've commanded the churches of, Gal of Galatia, even so do ye, upon the first day of every week. Lay by in store as God has prospered him. As we've been prospered is talking about the fact that we've been prospered. The periodic timetable is every first day of the week. Our giving is also to be proportionate. When we stop and honestly count our blessings, how proportionate is our offering to our blessings? Anybody out give your blessings yet? And we won't. But there's a proportionate amount there that God would expect. And often people ask, and desire to know that figure. And some even go another step and want to know, well, how much do I have to give? You see where that puts giving and what perspective it puts it? If I have to do it and I don't get to do it, then there's a step back that we need to take. 
How often do I have to come to worship? How often do I have to speak to somebody about their soul? How often do I have to be a Christian? How often do I have to do it? We've heard people ask those questions. Every child of God should be desiring to give the very most he can give. When we ask the question, how much does God give? How much did Christ give? How do we expect to please them if we want to give the least amount possible? Well, taking these matters into consideration ought to help us give and make us the best givers of all. But that's if we see our giving from a certain perspective. We should have the proper attitude and outlook toward our giving. As we purpose in our heart. We give with a purpose. We just don't give of the leftovers. We don't, uh, uh, when, when the uh, offering comes around, we, we reach in our pocket and throw something in. You know, that's, that's not an offering, that's a donation. That's a donation. Taking these matters into consideration changes the gift altogether. We should not begrudge the opportunity to give, but look upon it as a blessing to be able to do so. Sometimes there are temptations to think out elsewhere and not like this. God wants the mind, he wants the heart. This is supposed to be a spiritual offering first, as is the case with, with all uh, of our worship. Is the Christians giving into the treasury of the church on the Lord's day an expression of worship to God? Well, let's let the Bible speak for itself. Almighty God, being entirely self-sufficient, requires no gift from us. He doesn't require our money or our gifts in order to sustain him in any way. He's not served, right, by men's hands. That's what that passage means, as though he needed anything. But he is pleased, however, when we, consistent with the word of God, with divine revelation, exhibit the spirit of generosity. And it's a fact beyond dispute that the act of giving is an overture of worship, as we've indicated. In the Old Testament, sacrifices were brought to the Lord in worship as gifts from a proper heart, ideally, from the giver. When the wise men from the east, what did they do when they came to baby Jesus? What did they come to do? When they come to worship, what did they do? Did they give of their means? Well, of course they did. It's generally conceded that the word fellowship, koinonia, in Scripture, has at its root the idea of giving. If you and I are in fellowship, if we look at this venture that we call worship, then giving is a part of it. It embraces all of the other acts of worship. When the Philippian saints gave their money for the support of Paul, God views it, viewed it as a what? As an odor of a sweet smell. Isn't that figure used in worship throughout the Bible? Why would New Testament worship be any different than that? It's, it necessarily would follow that if the New Testament places upon the Christian an obligation to give of his means, when he neglects that, then he refuses to worship. Giving is the lifeblood of the Christian, and it's the lifeblood of worship. Jesus said, God is spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Truth here has reference to the content of Christian revelation. The God of heaven 
seeks worship. He must be worshipped. Not according to our own inclinations, but in harmony with the Bible. And when we see worship throughout, giving was a major part. When we think of faithfulness to Christ, any student of the Bible must concede that giving as an act of worship must be according to the guidelines set in, set in, in the Bible. And anything less than this is not pleasing to God. When Paul penned the epistle, the first epistle to the Corinthians, he wrote that 16th chapter for a reason. Oh yes, the specific reason was to take up a collection for poor saints, for the poor saints in Jerusalem. You know, when we take up a collection today, many times it's for poor saints. Many times it's for poor non-saints. And this term order, as I've given order, the word is employed many times in Scripture. It is the term diatasso. And it presupposes a subordinate relationship of one who is commanded to do something. Ordered. And because there was a specific order for this collection, doesn't mean that that collection or any other collection wasn't used for something else. When we think of our own individual obligation, the responsibility to worship, the responsibility to give, lies upon every child of God. Both the husband and the wife should decide together what they are willing to give. If there are two incomes, a portion from both would be required. If the young person at home has a part-time job, Dad, you better teach him how to give. Under the Mosaic system, there was a treasury in the temple. And it was there according to this pattern given by God. This is found in 1 Chronicles chapter 28. And the prophet Malachi admonished Israel, bring the tithes into the treasury, all of them. In Jesus' day, the court of the women within the temple was called, guess what? The treasury. Because it contained chests around the walls for Jewish contributions in their worship. As the antitype of the temple, the church also has a treasury to facilitate its financial obligations and operations. And Paul says that Christians are to lay by and store into that treasury. Not something that they keep for a while at home and then give it. On the first day of every week, let each of you lay somewhat by itself, literally here, according as he may have prospered, putting it into the treasury. Paul says at that time that when I come, that's not the Lord coming, by the way, that's Paul coming to get the funds, so that there be no last-minute gatherings when I come. If you want to be the giver that, you, that God wants you to be, you must first give of yourselves. And that's what is said about the Macedonians. And perhaps there is someone here this morning that needs to give of himself to God. Not just through a particular act, but maybe that act was engaged in, but the heart wasn't given. You know, you have an opportunity to do that. It's interesting how many times God gives us an opportunity to give of so many things at so many times. Will you give your life to Jesus today? Would you come to him and submit to him and be the giver? Not just in worship, certainly including that, but with all of your life. And be the kind of example that God wants you to be. How much should I give? Can we ever give enough? The answer is no. But we can always be the givers that we need to be in order to be included in the will of God and what he wants done on this earth. If there's anybody that needs to become a Christian today through faith, 
repentance, confession, and immersion in water, you have that opportunity. Give your heart to Jesus Christ today. While together we stand and sing. There's a Thank you for that lesson, Matt. It was a very good message this morning. Appreciate that. If you would, take out your bulletins. Uh, on the uh, back, there's a list of our shut-ins and members who have requested prayers. We're going to pray for them in, in just a moment, but there are a few other uh, things that I want to uh, draw to your attention. Uh, one, we want to remember the uh, family of uh, Rachel Smith after... Uh, her recent loss and just keep her and the rest of her family in your prayers this week and in the upcoming uh, days and weeks and reach out to them as, as I know you 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 will uh, and remember our uh, sick and shut-ins uh, and we're going to pray for them in just a moment but we also have some very uh, happy news to announce uh, we have uh, two new families who have placed membership here at the uh, Woodstock congregation uh, and I will ask them to stand up for just a second so everyone can put a face to a name. But Steve and Janice Allen uh, met with us uh, last week and placed membership. Thank you. It's great to have you guys here. And also Andrew and Natasha Perez. Uh, if you guys, there they are in the middle. And their children, uh, Drew and Nora. But it is great to have all these new families placing membership with us here in Woodstock. And, it's a wonderful thing to see the congregation grow, and uh, we want to we want to keep that uh, keep that tra trajectory going in the same direction. So that is just wonderful. Uh, we also want to uh, congratulate uh, Lance and Loretta on their new grandchild. And there's just a lot of things for us to be thankful for uh, in the in the Lord's body here at Woodstock. So uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer, shall we pray? Dear Lord, thank you for all the wonderful blessings of life. Thank you for allowing us to come together and worship you and, and uh, hear a, a message from your word. Lord, we...
pray that we apply the things that we've learned and uh, the message of your word about giving to our own lives. And we pray that our giving and, and every act of worship uh, will be pleasing to you, Lord, and in accordance with your will. And Lord, we are so thankful for the new families that have placed membership here. We pray that uh, we as their brothers and sisters in Christ will be an encouragement to them as they certainly are to us and that we'll all grow closer to you and closer to each other and, and bring more uh, souls to your kingdom through our work here locally and abroad. Lord, please be with uh, Miss Smith and her family after, after her loss, and we just pray that you'll comfort them and, and that we will be your uh, arms and legs here on earth to uh, comfort them as well and uh, help them through this troubling time. And thank you so much, Lord, for the wonderful hope of being reunited with our loved ones who've gone on before us and spending an eternity with you and our brothers and sisters in Christ in heaven. Please be with all the sick and the shut-in of, uh, of our number and even those that, that maybe we don't even know about today. And we just ask your blessings upon them. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen. To close out our worship service, let's stand together and sing the first and last verses of number 404, Looking to Thee. <coughs> I'd like to uh, remind you that uh, Lincoln needs our help with VBS, so on your way out, if you'll uh, sign up for some slots to volunteer, like he asked for volunteers. Volunteers, we all like the volunteers, don't we? Um, so if you have any questions regarding VBS, please. Lincoln, not being a volunteer. That's all awesome. Looking through the day to day.